morning, Highland. It's a great day to worship our God. Hope everybody's doing well this morning and has had a good weekend so far. Uh, in order to prepare our minds for worship, uh, let's take a look at uh, Psalm 100. Very familiar psalm. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And His faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful to be able to gather together as Christians here in this place. You are truly a great and awesome God. And our world around us, the heavens and the earth, declare your glory and your wisdom and your power. We're so thankful that you love us, and that you sent your son to die for us, and he rose again from the dead. We're thankful for the blessings that you give us through your son Jesus, spiritual blessings that never cease, that are priceless. We're also thankful for the things that we have here on earth, the basic necessities of life that you provide for us each and every day and, and so much more. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit that gives us your word, that inspired your servants, holy men, to, to give us your word. Pray that our worship here this morning will be pleasing in your sight as we humbly praise you and, and strive to be better Christians, better servants. We're thankful for our Highland family. There are those who we, we pray for that have lost loved ones, that are struggling with illness or, or, or struggling mentally with, with frustrations or or financial problems. Pray for those who are lonely or distressed. Pray that you let us focus on serving you and loving others and caring for each other, spreading the gospel. Always help us and provide us opportunities to, to serve you in your kingdom. Pray that you bless our, our ministers and our deacons and our elders and, they, and their families as they work to serve you. We also pray that you bless our missionaries who are in other countries who have dedicated their lives to serving you and preaching the gospel. Please be with them and, and their families. Pray for those who serve us in our community, first responders, law enforcement, fire, EMTs. Lord, if we are honest with ourselves and true to ourselves, we know that we are weak and sinful and we do not do the things that we should do. Help us to examine ourselves and once again recommit ourselves to faithfully serving you. Help us to have a zealous heart, always looking to 
to serve. Lord, recently we had two of our members who passed away who were a great example to this congregation. Two humble Christians that dedicated their lives to serving you who touched so many lives. Help us to be loving. Help us to be those who were known for their love for one another and for their service to one another. Forgive us as every sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I sing praises to your name. Scripture comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 through 15. Paul is speaking to the church in Thessalonica, saying, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace amongst yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to everyone and to every to one another and to everyone. When I
Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in just a minute if you want to flip there and read along in just a moment. Um, I've gone to church at Highland since I was around 13 years old, I think. So some of you have been with me through the good times, and some of you when I was 13, not the good times. But um, one of my favorite memories of youth group was um, my best friend Brady Hammond and I would deliver communion to shut-ins, um, and that was one of the most impactful things probably that I did in my time in the youth group. It wasn't the retreats, it wasn't the uh, fun things that we did, but it was serving and um, going into homes of people who couldn't get out to deliver the Lord's Supper. Because at every time we went to a house, we always were told, thank you, I need to take the Lord's Supper. I need to do this. I have to do this. Jesus commanded me to do this. I have to do this. To hear that so many times from people who can't get out and are just so thankful, it made me realize at a young age that uh, the Lord's Supper was something that was more important than, <laughs> than what I thought. They had the attitude that they had to partake of the Lord's Supper. And that's beautiful. I was never looked at as a 16-year-old <laughs> who just drove with his buddy to give the Lord's Supper. I was looked at as an appreciated person who brought them what they needed so they could participate in the act of communion. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23, says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance for me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of of the Lord. Let a person examine themselves then, and so of, of the bread and drink of the cup. For if anyone eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Powerful words, unworthy manner. How many of us here today are just here to take our chip and our sip and move on to next week? I can tell you that of all the people that I delivered communion to as a 16-year-old, none of them were guilty of that. Let's just try to think about these things as we pray that we are doing this in a worthy manner. Father God, I thank you for this day. I'm thankful for, thankful for the opportunity for prayer and thankful that you listen. I'm thankful that you're my Father and our Father and thankful for you sending Jesus to be our sacrifice because we do things constantly that are against your will. Father, as we are about to partake of this bread that represents the body of Jesus, help us to partake of it in a way, in a worthy manner to you that will bring glory to you. And Father, to be with us as we partake of it as we do so. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray again. Father God, we are once again honored to call you Father. 
And once again, we're so thankful for the sacrifice that only you could have made, that none of us could have done. We're thankful for that, for Jesus and the sacrifice he made and the blood that was spilt that day. We're thankful that it's cleansing, that it is, cleanses us constantly. Father, I ask you to be with us now as we partake of this juice that represents his blood as he hung on the cross. Help us to do so in a worthy manner as we do this. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, you've done so much for us, and um, at this time, it's time for us to give back a portion of what you've blessed us with to you. Father, we ask you to be with us as we give that portion back. Help us to be cheerful givers. Help us to give um, our first fruits. Help us um, to give this money in a way that um, the elders will put it to good use benefiting the Highland family, but not just the Highland family, the Columbia community, Murray County, across the world. Help us to make an impact all throughout the world that people will know that we are Christians and that we are in your light. In Jesus' name, amen. you guys could come out and be with us. Thank you for watching with us today. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is where we're going to spend uh, uh, the majority of our time today. We've been talking for the past few weeks. Uh, David's been leading us a series of lessons. This year we're talking about being God's family and how important this is to be God's family. Actually, I missed my first slide there. How important it is to be God's family in general. And this idea of family is an acrostic. We've talked the first couple of months about being people of faith and, and building up our faith and the importance of faith. We're talking the A stands for accountability, and this is this idea of better together. We're going to talk about one another today is what we're going to be discussing here at the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So again, go ahead and turn your Bible there if you will. And additionally, when the M uh, comes up in another month or so, we're going to spend a couple of months talking about our mission. What's the mission of the, of the church? We have a lot of missionaries that we support and some mission works we do around the globe, but we also do some things here in Murray County. We're always looking to expand that, and we're also going to talk about our personal obligation to be a part of that. As we think about this, the, the I is about involvement. We want you to be involved in the work. What does that look like to be involved in the work of the Highland Church of Christ? The L is simply this, is love. We're going to talk about God's love for us, our love for one another, our love for um, the world around us, and most of all, of course, our love for God in turn, not just God's love for us. But then the why is kind of all-encompassing. It's, it's you. If you hear this, we want you to be part of this. I don't think because, oh, I just come here sometimes or, or, or I'm not really a member here or something like that. That doesn't mean we don't need you and we don't want you because we do. 
We do indeed. So as we think about this, today we're going to talk about our roles and our responsibilities. So many years ago, I moved in, let's see, this has been July of 2007 when I moved to Kentucky. <laughs> and I was growing up, my dad, I'm just going to play the David Morris for a minute and walk off the stage here for a second. Uh, when I was growing up, my dad, he hated, absolutely hated cats. And um, supposedly he told a story that when he was like a little kid, his mom caught him trying to end the lives of some cats in a bucket of water. So I don't know. He, he didn't like cats. That's the point. I found a cat one time. I had been to my aunt's, one of my aunt's houses and brought home a cat. And it had to stay outside, so I kind of got by with it. And, um, but our dog hated this cat. He was a chow the cat didn't like the dog. The dog sure didn't like the cat. And uh, being a, a, a not too smart young man, I got in the middle of it kind of, and actually got bit pretty bad by the dog one time because of the cat. So never allowed to have a cat. So when we moved to Kentucky, one of the first things we did was we went to one of the local football games. And we were there, and uh, this, uh, this couple we knew, they had a teenage daughter. And the teenage daughter had a friend and comes up with this thing right here. This little, it's cute. It is cute. Kittens are cute. I don't care if you don't like cats or not. Kittens are cute. And so solid black, blue eyes, had probably been weaned a little bit too early. You know, maybe like six or seven weeks old. Tiny, would fit in my hand. It's cute. And guess who wanted a cat? It was me. Guess who didn't want a cat? My wife. She said she was allergic to them, but not highly allergic, but she, she did have a little allergy to them. And she told me no several times, and I said, okay. And then finally, I just accepted the fact, I'm a grown man. I can have a cat if I want a cat, right? <laughs> 100%. So we leave the ball game with a cat. Well, instead of going home, guess where we went? We had to go to Walmart because, you know, cats need a litter pan. They need litter. They need maybe a couple of toys. They certainly need food. They need a bowl, you know, to put the food in, the water. So I had thought of none of these things. I just wanted a cat. So we went, and my wife, to her, to her credit, she begrudgingly went into Walmart on her own about 10 o'clock that night, 1030, and got these things. So we, we have this cat. It's a girl. The cat's name's Fiona. We only had two boys at the time, so we were very excited. My, daughter, my wife's happy to have a girl. Uh, so the cat gets sick a few weeks later and, you know, had to take it to the vet. And my cat had a major change after this because suddenly uh, Amanda calls me and goes, uh, Brian, there's a problem. I said, what's that? She goes, uh, the cat's a boy. It had just grown a little bit. That's all. We were able to tell now properly what this cat was. So we never named the cat anything other than cat after that. He got called Fat Cat and Cat, you know, and those kind of things. And uh, uh, when Elena was really little, she would call him Pat Pat, you know, that kind of thing, trying to say cat. But so you go from here to here. <laughs> and I promise you, this is not because I've zoomed in and the picture's distorted. Well, maybe just a little bit because I cut off part of it. This cat grew into like a puma. <laughs> At his best, 20 pounds. And I took him to the vet. Now, he was just a big fat cat. That's it. I took him to the vet one time, and I said, why is my cat so big? And he goes, he's just a big cat. Well, I already knew that, but, and, and you know, he was a little fat, too. But, but nonetheless, and he, him and the dog would fight all the time, you know, just playing around. You know, I saw him attack the dog and stuff like that. And, 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 and fat cat, he, uh, he, uh, he passed away several years ago. But um, my point is, as I was thinking about the cat, and I just had to have a cat, the reality was I had not really thought a whole lot about the practical responsibilities of the cat initially, beyond going from little tiny, oh, it's cute kitten, to, man, that's a cat. Man, that's a lot of cat. And then the cat gets sick, and then the cat needs to be fixed. The cat needs to be taken to the vet. You know, all of these things. I mean, I knew that had to happen, but I had not given a lot of thought to it initially, you know, as in we had like zero things for a cat when we initially, uh, when we initially got this thing. And uh, so regardless, do we ever think about our responsibilities to one another as Christians? Do you ever think about the fact that there are practical responsibilities and things that I owe to you and you owe to me and vice versa? Do you ever thought about those kind of things? 
So just as the cat required certain things to be cared for and, and, and to maintain having a cat, there are certain things we have to do as Christians. And just by virtue of being a Christian, each of us have a set of responsibilities and obligations. And just like the practical and basic things that I needed to take care of my cat, and still do because we have another cat now, there are practical, basic things that God expects from each of us. As Paul wrote to the book, uh, wrote, wrote to the book, excuse me, wrote to the church at Thessalonica, Paul had heard at the beginning of the book, chapter 1, verse 10, as you kind of follow along if you want to, a little brief outline here, he'd already heard about how they had shared their faith and they were sharing their faith with other people, and he was very excited about hearing this. Additionally, he was reminded of how they had received God's Word, chapter 2 and verse 13, that they, they really accepted it as being authoritative and from God Himself. And he was reminded of not only how they had received it, received it, but he sent Timothy to encourage them and check on this church. And Timothy came back and just had awesome, wonderful good news about how well the church at Thessalonica was doing. That's in chapter 3. And Paul wanted to remind them to remain faithful and live pure lives. Chapter 4, he spent some time correcting some misunderstandings about the second coming of Christ. And then he closes it out here in chapter 5, out with this letter, about these very practical uh, responsibilities of how we remain faithful, how we live these lives of purity before God and before one another. And, and he leaves this with this whole list of these practical responsibilities, basic things that each of us should be doing for each other, but it all, not just ex- doing them for each other, but also expecting them from one another. So let's talk this morning about your responsibilities in Christ. And so as we wade into this passage of Scripture this morning, I want us each to ask ourselves this question beginning, how well am I, not just me, how well am I individually, insert your name, how how well am I doing with this? How am I doing with this? Am Am I keeping up with this? Am I handling my responsibilities and obligations? Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Those sorts of things. Now, does this describe the kind of person I am? These responsibilities are more than just showing up for worship. They're easily broken down, I really think, in three main areas of responsibility. So beginning in verse 12, he says, But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one repays evil to anyone for with evil, for with always, for, but always, rather, seek that which is good for one another and all people. Verse 16, he says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also who brings, will bring it to pass. Pray for us all. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord. To have this letter read to all the brethren, grace to our Lord Jesus Christ, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So let's back up here. Beginning at the, at, at the first part of this, verse 12, let's talk about our responsibilities to our leaders. I think you recognize at least one face on here. You should recognize all the faces on here. It says simply this, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you who have charge over you, Lord, and give you instruction. The idea here is this is the responsibility to our elders. We acknowledge and we know our leaders. We know who these people are. Three primary reasons. The very first thing he says is this, is that they labor, they work among you. The idea, of course, is working to the point of, of, of exhaustion. Uh, it, I remember when I was a kid, my grandpa had uh, grown... He, he, around his house, it actually years later was a, was a hayfield, but one of the first couple of years he lived there, <laughs> he, he planted acres of, of bell peppers. And he um, had hired a couple of uh, teenagers in our, in our community to come and, uh, and pick these peppers. And uh, I was determined I was going to help. 
and he was going to pay $5 a bucket. And I thought, you know, I could probably at least do something real simple, like maybe 30, 40 buckets at least was my goal. Oh, I was like seven or eight. Surely this is going to happen. So I went out there, had my grandmother come get me. And I get out there and I recognize the two, the two teenage kids that were doing this. And they're just, you know, working away, picking these bell peppers, bucket after bucket after bucket. And I'm out there digging away, man. I'm, I'm pulling off these peppers, picking them and pulling off these peppers. Well, you know, it's summertime. And, you know, what, what happens when, when it's summertime? It gets hot, right? It wasn't too long. I started getting hot and I started getting sweaty and I started getting really, really hot. Then my head started hurting, you know, and I remember I went into the house and I said, man, this is just too much. And I could barely even pick up a whole bucket of peppers. And so I brought about half a bucket of peppers back and I went and I laid in the air conditioning at my grandparents' house in front of the fan for the rest of the day. And my grandpa laughed at me. He felt so bad. He gave me $5 anyways. But I had pretty much worked to the point of exhaustion. So the idea when it says that they labor among you is that, that, they, that this is intense work. It may not be physically exhausting all the time, but they work to a point of exhaustion. The second idea is that they have authority over you. Okay, let's think about this. These gentlemen right here, myself included there in the middle of the top picture, we have authority over you. What is this? It's never because of fear of their authority, but it's the idea that God needs someone to be in charge, and he needs the right people to be in charge. We have a set of qualifications laid out and. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 of the kind of qualities that individuals should have to be elders and that, that qualifies them to do that work. And then after that, the idea is that they admonish one another. And so the, the idea of admonishing one another, it is they give instruction, they teach, they direct. When an elder is serving as he should do and as he should be, it's hard work and there's a lot of responsibility. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 13, 17 says that they keep watch for your souls. That's a very heavy, heavy responsibility. We had an elders meeting this morning. We always have a prayer at the beginning, at the end of the meeting. And then uh, as, as we close this prayer, I led the prayer. And James said, James, James Pierce says, I want to continue this prayer. And one of the things he prayed about, and I really appreciate it, was he prayed specifically for the church here. And he prayed for our, our, our leadership, that we'll, we, will, we will guide and we'll lead this church in the right direction and, and those sorts of things. Now, I really appreciate the sincerity with that. Additionally, we see that, that this is something that, that is described in Titus chapter 1 and uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 as a work. And so he simply says that we acknowledge them, we esteem them, but, but why? Why are we to do this? Well, they, they labor they have authority over us. They admonish. They give instruction. But next, what he says is that we esteem them. And when we think about esteeming an elder, and we think about the responsibility and hard work that it does take to be an elder at times, we have to realize now, he simply says, to admonish one another. As you, not just admonish one another, but that you, verse 13, esteem them very highly in love because of their work's sake. Now, let's think about this. What, what does this mean? What does esteem them? Does it mean a pat on the back? Well, we appreciate that. Does it mean a handshake? We appreciate that. Now, there, there, there's more. So, so to esteem something means to consider it in high regard. Okay, and then he says, he adds to it, that you not only do this to high regard, but notice what the text says. He says, Esteem them how? How does he describe it next? What's, what's the next word he says? Very highly, right? Now, this is where you take it to be, you, you do this beyond what you normally would. When I was five years old, the greatest thing on the planet in my mind, beyond He Man, was Hulk Hogan. It was awesome. He couldn't be stopped. I did see him fight Andre the Giant. He got choked a few times. I mean, it would just like deeply upset me to see them fight, you know. And I do remember at WrestleMania when Hulk Hogan picked this man. He weighed 500 pounds up and he body slammed him and it was just awesome. I remember all this. So this is my Hulk Hogan thumb wrestler. It's in my office even today. You can see I loved him so much I chewed his face off at one time right there, his nose and his hands. I clearly... I think I even nibbled on his feet, as most kids would do with toys. You know, you bite on things and 
put things in your mouth that you, ne- you shouldn't necessarily. But, but I highly esteemed Hulk Hogan. When he says esteem them very highly, oh, this is how I felt about Hulk Hogan. Uh, that guy hung the moon, or at least he could pick it up and throw it up in the sky in my mind when I was that age. And, and, and the point is, you know, even, even as like, you know, a, a 43-year-old man, this is one of my prized possessions right here. It might be worth about $2, but man, it just means so much to me. It's a piece of my childhood that I've connected and, you know, one of those rare things that I found I still had. That's how I felt about Hulk Hogan. Now, here's the point. Your elders are not professional wrestlers by any means, but the idea is that, that you esteem them very highly. And it's not just that you do it just because they're celebrities or anything like that. You regard them and consider them as someone or something as being special. And you do this, the idea is, beyond what's normally expected. It's kind of like if you had a container, if you had the sugar bowl and you're filling it up, you would stop because it only holds so much. But you just keep pouring and pouring. And it's overflowing the way you feel about them. Now, this isn't just something to send here and prop up the eldership, and this is how you guys feel about us. Because, again, we've got to go back to this idea right here. An elder has the responsibility to serve as they should and be the kind of men they should. And when someone is being the kind of person they should be, which adds a lot of extra responsibility in us to live and be an example and try those things, try to carry that out, when they're being the kind of people they should be, then this is how we should feel about them. But Paul also adds that we esteem them very highly because of the work's sake, and we do so with the motivation, the idea behind it, is we do it out of love. The motivation for the action is love. We make a mental decision, in this case, what? To respect someone's leadership, to prove it by following them. And, and the truth is we need great leaders. We also need great followers. Ever work for a boss you didn't like? Well, I'll do what they say because they're my boss, but boy, I don't like that guy. See him coming and, oh my goodness, can't stand him or her. Maybe you've been the boss that nobody liked. I hope, I hope you figured it out if you were. We have leaders, elected officials. I can't stand him. I can't stand her. Not my president. Not my. We say things like that, but the truth of the matter is, if you're in the United States, regardless if you like him or not, they're still your president. But the point is simply being is you don't act that way. It's not the way we're to do. Not my elders. Forget them. They're the worst. Well, if you feel that way, come talk to us first and tell us why you feel that way. Let, let's talk it out. But the point is, is that we make a mental decision, not just like the boss we don't like. Well, I'm going to do it because I'm going to lose my job and I can't, I've got no other choice. We're kind of forced into this. It's begrudgingly we'll do what they say. We make a mental decision to respect the elders and their leadership and prove it by following them and being engaged with what they're asking from us. We need great leaders, yes, as I said, but we also need great great followers. Oftentimes, leadership gets critiqued, sure, but what about the followers? When we do so, Paul then says, live in peace with one another. So we've seen, number one, the responsibilities, our responsibility towards our leaders right? Now we move toward responsibility to our brethren, to what we will owe each other. Okay, here we go. So one, he simply says this, live in peace with one another. Okay, and now, now notice, if you had decided that your elders were the kind of men they should be, assuming they should be, and they are, and then you decided, you know what, they have our best intentions in mind, and and, and, and we're going to go along with this. We're going to support the work. If we've got any ideas of how it could be done better, we'll talk to them. They're open to talking about these things, okay? And you see, I, I'm going to be a part of I'm going to be committed to this. Do you see how that works into that idea of, and I'm going to respect these men, live at peace with one another? Do you see how it would be a lot easier to live at peace with one another in a situation like that, in a set of circumstances like that? And now we take it further. Notice what he says next that you live at peace with one another. And then he says, verse 14, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. So several practical things we must be doing. It's about offering the help, okay? Admonish the unruly, including the busybody, the gossipers, those folks. The unruly, it's the idea of the soldier who will break ranks and march out of steps, and march out of step on purpose those who are idle in the work of Christ, 
Some people need a good, strong warning or a kick to get them moving and motivated to be a part of it. That's the idea of admonishing. It's not just, hey, you need to kind of get... It's, it's a warning. It's a strong encouragement. You really need to do this. We really need you to be on board. We've got to have you help with this. You are someone we need, or, or however that might play out. But it's not just admonish and say, hey, you, over here, we need your help. It's not just that. Then he says that we comfort and we encourage the faint-hearted. Those who are discouraged, those who are losing heart. How do we do that? Well, one, we pray for them. We let them know they're loved. We remind them they're needed. We remind them that they, they are missed when they're not here. We visit them. We call them. We, we tell others, hey, these people are missing. Could you do it? Someone just mentioned to me last week, the week before last, hey, you know, I haven't seen this particular couple in a while. And I was like, you know, you're right. And I'll admit, I just kind of forgotten because they just kind of fell through the cracks in my mind. I asked a couple other people about it, and, and we, no, and we haven't seen them in a while. And you know what we did? We made an effort to call them. Absolutely. And you know what they did? They came back to church the next week. I haven't seen them since, but my point being is that there was an attempt to make a contact and a connection with them. And when I saw them, I for sure let them know, hey, I tried to call you, and I also let them know I missed them when they were wanted. But let's also think about this. This isn't just members who are, you know, not, not with us, not going, not, not with us anymore. But encourage the faint-hearted. You know anybody whose heart's weighed down with grief, with sadness? You know anybody who's facing some very difficult circumstances right now? Maybe they're going to lose a job. Maybe they're facing something very difficult with their health or, or, or just, you know, things are tough in life for them right now. Does that ever make you feel faint-hearted? You ever face anything hard? How'd you feel during that? It's hard. But isn't it great when people come alongside you and tell you they love you and they care for you and they pray for you and they want you to be a part of this? Does that help you? It's always helped me when people have done that. So we encourage them. Next, we uphold the weak. Uphold means stand with, cleave to, pay attention to. Place your focus on, not just I'm here for you or in your corner, that's important, but I'm really putting the focus and attention on it. I'm putting some effort into it beyond this, upholding the weak. Galatians chapter 6, 2, what's it say? Well, let's turn there because I just forgot what it said actually. But Galatians chapter 6, 2, and as soon as I look at this, I'm going to go, oh yeah, that's right. Here it is. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Do you see the point with all of this? Bearing a burden, it's like you're carrying something heavy. Hey, let me help you with that. Let me help. Isn't it easier when somebody helps you with that? Now, never mind if you're bringing in groceries, because evidently my children scatter when it's time to bring in groceries. You know, but, but, but the point simply being... Isn't it easier when other people are helping you along, seriously, especially carrying something heavy? So we uphold the weak. And then he says this. The idea of the weak here, of course, is not just the spiritually weak, but those who suffer and struggle with sin and temptation. All of us struggle with something. Confess it and let us pray for one another. And then he shifts from here to upholding the weak. And defining what the weak means, not just those who are physically weak, but those who are spiritually weak as well. Then he goes on to, okay, so we've got these obligations here, these responsibilities of one to offer the help. And now we've offered help, but notice how this builds on itself. We offer the help, but in addition to offering the help, now we do things that will prevent the problems. These things here, if done, will stop the end problems, and the rest of them prevent it. Notice what he says, and now, here it is, be patient with everyone. How hard is that? Be patient with everyone. All right, all right. We had my wife's family over for Easter the week before last. Came over a week ago Saturday. <coughs> and uh, my nephew's seven, his sister's five. They adore Elena. 
She's like their big sister for a while. You know, they just cling to her and follow her all over the place. We have a pool. And you know what happens every time the, it gets just a little bit warm, you've got, to, you've got to play near the pool. And they're playing near the pool, and my wife's dad, my father-in-law, comes in, and he said something about, well, started to say something to my, my sister-in-law about Henry, her son, and said, I, yeah, I'm not going to tell you what Henry said. He told me not to tell what happened. And we're like, what? And he goes, no, no, no. He said he'd just die if we told. And my father-in-law was kind of teasing. And I go outside and I look, and for some reason, Henry's wet from here down. Like shoes and everything, just, just, just wet. Uh, what happened here? Oh, I fell in the pool. Oh, convenient. Somehow you just fell in the pool. So I tell him to come inside. I'm like, hey, man, just, just get down to your, you know, take off your shorts and your shirt. You know, we'll throw them in the dryer right quick, you know. And he's like, why? And I was like, well, your choice is that or go home with wet clothes. Well, I'll just go home with wet clothes. My sister-in-law is kind of irritated about it, right? And the man and I stop and go, hey, Marley's not that big of a deal. It's okay. And kind of smile. And, she go, and I said, you won't worry about it this time next, next year. It won't be that big of a deal. And she goes, yeah, but I still have the right to be mad about it. And you're right. But what's my point? My point is this, is that Amanda and I have reached a point, particularly with younger kids, we're like, oh, that's like a grandparent perspective. I don't want any grandchildren for years to come, but you get my point. It's like, oh, it doesn't matter. that It's not that big of a deal that he fell in the pool. Who cares? Come on, do what you want. You know, that kind of stuff. And, and, and it's just a, a level of patience that we've kind of gotten to. That certain things that used to really set us off are not quite that big of a deal anymore. How patient are we with other people? I've talked about others uh, at patience and times. My grandmother was, oh, man, probably because she married my grandpa. Very patient. But she would take me to the doctor sometime when I was sick and get there before the office. Like, we beat the doctor there. You know, he didn't call for an appointment. He just kind of showed up and they'd work you in. And, we'd be, and I would be like, Granny, they don't open for 30 minutes. Well, we want to get here first. No one's in the building. You know, and it would drive me crazy sometimes because I'd have to get up early. Patience, patience. She could wait you out. Patient. But then he goes on and he says, Do not render evil for evil or seek you know, getting even with people, that kind of idea. And said, he says, seek good. Paul said not to do this in Romans chapter 12. And he said, instead, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. The idea is you kill them with kindness. For in doing so, you heap coals of fire upon their head. They can't stand it. It burns them up. It's awful. I'm trying to get you. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm out to get you. And you're just being excessively kind to me. Don't render evil for evil. Don't get even. Seek good. Especially when wrong, don't try to get even. And then he says, after this, as we look in the mirror of God's word, and we see, he says, see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. All right, how are we doing so far? As we look in the mirror of God's word and we see this, how are you doing with this? How's your responsibility toward your leaders? How are your responsibilities toward others? What are you doing? How are you with all this? When was the last time you were patient with everybody? When was the last time you didn't try to get even? And then we go into some of this also. I think there's a bit of personal responsibility and obligation in all of this. That that we also need to we also need to, you know, realize we have obligations to ourselves. We need to be responsible to ourselves. And that's the last part of this. The last of these things are not just what we owe our leaders, not just what we owe one another, but what do we owe ourselves? What kind of obligations do you have to yourself here? Well, if you don't see yourself as worth it or valuable enough to do these things, you're not really taking seriously what God says about you and what God wants for you. And so what does it say? What are, the, what are the obligations? What are the responsibilities that I have toward myself? Well, let's keep reading. Here's one. Rejoice always. Isn't it interesting? Paul starts there. Rejoice always. You mean to tell me the sun's shining and it's going to be 75 degrees today? Rejoice in that, right? It's not cold. Anybody with me? Am I the only one that cares that today's weather-wise good day? Good day, yes. Easy rejoice, Yep. Anybody go freeze at Mule Day yesterday? I sure didn't. I rejoice at that. The weather's better, right? 
There's sometimes it's a lot easier to rejoice, right? When you get to do what you want, things are going well, the weather's good, sun's shining, those kind of things. But you mean to tell me I'm supposed to rejoice? I got a family member dying. I lost my spouse. I'm losing my job. I can't afford that. My health is failing. Well, what does Paul say? Rejoice always. Always reasons to rejoice. Always be thankful for what God has given us, what God has done, and what God will do and can do. And sometimes we don't always know it. So this is an obligation, responsibility toward yourself. Next, pray without ceasing. It's an idea that you stay in constant communication with God to a point that, that, that you know, it's just natural. It flows out of you. Ever call someone they don't answer? Okay, let me ever text someone they don't answer for days. Sometimes just to aggravate my wife, surely not. She'll text me like, are you home? And I've already been home. And like an hour later, I'll say yes or something like that, you know, just to respond back. Ever call someone or, you know, yeah, and I realize not everybody can talk every time when you call them. And you get sent to voicemail or you get a text, I can't talk right now. And they, they, they don't call back at all, you know, for whatever reason. Sometimes they don't have to. But you know, you never get God's voicemail. God always answers the phone. I have a private business. And people call me and I answer my phone. You, you call me, I'm probably going to answer the phone 90% of the time. And, and a few, few months ago, my son Ethan, who's, who's in the Marine Corps, called me. And I answered the phone. And I go, hey, man, what's up? And he goes, oh, nothing. He said, see, I told you. And I said, what? And he goes, oh, I told my friend, when, when I call you, you answer. <laughs> okay. The idea about pray without ceasing is, oh, the phone's ringing. God picks up and he answers. It's you. He's calling. And he wants to hear from you. He goes on and he says, and everything, give thanks. Again, all those things I listed before, sometimes it's easier to be thankful than not. But in everything, give thanks. Do not quench the Spirit. What's this mean? Well, it's kind of this. It's the idea that, that it's probably the misuse of miraculous gifts and powers. Paul dealt with some of this in First, Thess uh, you see, First Corinthians. But the ultimate big application to us would be we, we quench the Spirit by putting out the Spirit's influence in our lives. And God influences by His Spirit through, through His words. So, so don't, don't let this go in one ear and out the other. Hear what God has to say. Don't quench the Spirit. Then he goes on and he says, do not despise prophetic utterances. Prophetic utterances are the idea of, of being able to have the gift of prophecy. It was a miraculous gift. But it's the idea it gave people the ability to proclaim God's word in a special way. And, and again, for what would that mean to us today? Don't despise God's truth when it's being proclaimed. Don't despise what's being said. But then on the, on the, same, on the, on the same turn, Paul then says, Test all things. And really, what he means by this is don't just, okay, well, look, someone's preaching the gospel and you're hearing what's being said. Well, don't despise it. Don't just discount it and, and never mind it. Listen to what it said, but also, Paul says, don't just believe everything that's said either. Put some effort into this and pay attention to what's being said. Does that make any sense? Does it line up with the rest of what Scripture teaches? Don't believe everything you hear, especially if it's from someone that's religious. Consider the source, investigate it. Stop gossiping and rumors. Make God's word the standard. Too many people accept things without thought. Then he next says, abstain from evil. Now, let's just be honest, man. There's a lot of things. Abstain from every form of evil. There are a lot of things we need to avoid. The idea is don't pull it to you, you push it away, and if it's too big to push away, you're in turn, you know, pushing yourself away from it. Don't bring lying into your life. Don't bring an emotional affair that could lead to a physical affair. Don't bring alcohol into your life. Don't bring drugs into your life. Don't bring pornography into your life. Don't bring anger. I didn't say we can't get mad sometimes. Yes, but don't let that be your go-to. 
Don't let rage become a part of your life. Don't let malice, which is I've been mad and I'm going to get even, I'm plotting to get them. Don't let those things be part of your life. Because we all have these responsibilities. There are only things that I can do and only things that you can do. And the more we dig into God's Word, the more we want to be His people, the more we see that we are responsible for and accountable to one another. So develop this attitude and this action to show our elders we love them and we'll follow them in their leadership, encourage them along what they're doing. We also need to get together and know each other. We've got an opportunity for that tonight. And our evening worship service is going to be devoted to fellowship and a meal and some projects of service. We need to be able to know each other well enough that we're not afraid to challenge each other and stop things before they get started. And why? Why would we shy away from those who are hurting? Don't shy away from those who are hurting. Let them know we love them, we care for them, we pray for them, and we want them to be a part of this. So then the next question is simply this. How serious do you take these responsibilities? As, we, as, as, as Scott comes forward and we, we have this invitation song, I just want you to think about everything that's been said and realize this question right here. It starts with you.